So we now have all the elements uh, to look at the um, social planners problem uh, and um, try to you know, make further progress towards um, describing optimal public expenditure you know, in a world in which there is unemployment and unemployment may be inefficient. Uh, so in, our, in the framework that we are looking at, what is, a social, what is a social planner's problem? So we look at it and then we'll try to understand how public expenditure affects various elements of social welfare. Um, and therefore, we'll understand the trade-offs that are faced by the social planner. That's what, that's what I want to do now. Um, and then, of course, once we have understood that, then we can actually formally solve um, the optimal policy problem and then derive formulas to describe optimal policy. Um, So what is the social planner's problem here? So social planner, the goal is just to maximize welfare. Uh, so here we have a representative household. So welfare is just the utility of one household, which we call U. And the utility of the household depends on C, which you know, is a share of um, workers that are actually uh, producing in the private sector, and then G, which is a share of workers who are producing in the, in the public sector. So here, instead of you know, measuring um, consumption, we directly assume that labor is an input into the utility function. Um, so we assume that labor embeds uh, the services uh, that it, it's going to uh, provide uh, the households. Uh, so the planner, the goal of the planner is to maximize welfare. Welfare is just utility, so you want to maximize this. Here, notice there are no dynamics. Uh, you know, here we assume that the, we are just looking at a static problem, and the model could be dynamic. But um, if the model is dynamic, the assumption is that the model would converge immediately uh, to its solution, even if you have dynamics. So basically, even if the model is dynamic in the sense that there's a temporal dimension, you would jump immediately to its solution, you jump uh, and there is no transitional dynamics and therefore at any point in time, maximizing you know, intertemporal welfare is just the same as maximizing flow welfare um, in a world like this in, in which you don't have uh, transitional dynamics. So for instance, that's exactly what we had in our dynamic model that we covered in, earlier in the course. It is a dynamic model, but once you solve it, you realize that actually the solution of the model is to jump immediately you know, to, to that solution, which is a, a critical point of a dynamical system uh, without any transitional dynamics. Uh, so here we're in a world like this in which the dynamics are not important and therefore we just maximize um, flow welfare. Um, and what is the constraint here is of course the constraint is that uh, the share of workers that are producing in the private sector is going to depend on, so the key thing here is that of course Number of workers in the public sector is going, to, if you have more of them, you have more public goods that increase utility. Um, but the key thing that we have is that, of course, uh, how much uh, private um, goods the household can enjoy is going to be influenced by how much public goods there is. Because, of course, there's only a finite number of workers in the labor force. And if you devote more of them to provision of public goods, fewer of them will be able to produce private goods. So there'll be a trade off here. Um, and so, in fact, G will influence um, C, so share of workers that are, so these are basically, these are workers in the private sector, um, which pro produce private goods, and these are workers in the public sector. Okay. So the key thing is that G is going to influence C, that's why we have an interesting trade-off. So uh, how does this trade-off look like, actually? Um, so the key thing is that uh, we know that C which is the share of workers that are in the private sector, it's one. So one, this is just the labor force, minus U plus V. So these are just non-productive workers. U are workers who are unemployed. V are workers who are doing recruiting, minus uh, G, right? So this is, just, uh, this is just the labor force. These are just non-productive workers. 
And of course, these are just public workers. And so the private workers is everybody, minus the guys who are non-productive, minus the guys who work in the public sector. Uh, okay, so what therefore what we see is that um, the social planner's problem is to choose G to maximize the utility of one minus U plus V minus G, G. Okay, so here you can see that the trade-off faced by the government, they start to become clearer. Uh, so here, of course, these are, if you have more workers, more public expenditure, more workers in the public sector, you have more public goods, so which is a good thing. Um, but you can see that, of course, all these workers that are in the public sector, they cannot be in the private sector. And so that's why you have this minus G here. Uh, and so basically, uh, that in that sense, you know, uh, public employment tends to mechanically reduce, crowd out one for one private employment like this. So public employment tend to try, crowd out private employment. That's just totally mechanical. It's just that the worker cannot be in two places at the same time. So here you start to see a bit uh, the trade-off that the government faces. And then you have an additional element that we haven't mentioned and which will allow us to complete our analysis is that addition. So, so this first constraint here is just, uh, if you want, you know, it's just a resource constraint. It's just saying that, well, the size of the labor force is fixed and it has to be split between these uh, different activities. So this you can think of it as a resource constraint. So that's one part of the problem. Now, uh, in addition, a key thing is that uh, the unemployment rate is also going to be determined by uh, public spending. So there is also, uh, the model also captures the fact that public spending, public expenditure plays a role in stabilization. So it's not true that the unemployment rate just stays the same, uh, just stays the same if you change public spending. Um, and so in addition, we have to take into account the fact that through public spending, you can, um, you know, maybe reduce unemployment and have an impact on the number of workers who are employed and the number of aggregate activity you have. So you also have the stabilization component. Um, so, in addition to um, the resource constraints that we that we have, we also know that in the model, um, public expenditure has an effect on unemployment. So we have a stabilization assumption is that we we um, and you know, we'll see down the line. This is in this way that our analysis is different from the Samuelson analysis because Samuelson worked in a in a world, you know, that was neoclassical. And there, you know, there was no unemployment. And so there was no like stabilization going on. Unemployment was zero, that's all there was to it. But here we work in a world with slack in which there is unemployment. And therefore public spending can affect actually how, you know, the amount of activities there is. So the stabilization assumption is that the unemployment rate uh, so I guess it's two for unemployment rate depends on G. So you have a function U of G that summarizes the effect of um, public expenditure on unemployment. But of course, then through the Bevuch curve, um, they, you know, the number of recruiters depends on unemployment. And of course, because the number of unemployed depends on public spending, um, I guess we can say that the The so recruiting rate, you know, the share of the labor force that's de de devoted to recruiting will also depend on G. And that's, of course, through the beverage curve. So V, so U is a U of G, and so V is the number of recruiters, the function V of the unemployment rate, that's the beverage curve, which is itself a function of public spending, that's uh, you know the general assumption that we made earlier that unemployment depends on G. So unemployment rate and recruiting rate, um, they both depend on G, and so that's going to uh, introduce a stabilization dimension to our 
uh, to our problem. So the social, so here I should have said this is, uh, so here, so the So the planner's problem had become something like this. And so now we can even have a, oops, we can have the full version of our planner's problem. Once we take into account the resource constraint and we take account the stabilization. So the goal of the, of the planner is therefore to maximize by choosing public spending, the utility, uh, and so here we can use what we had above, but except that now we take into account the fact that u and v depends on g as well. So we have u of 1 minus u of g plus v of u of g minus g and g. So this is actually a full uh, planner's problem. This is our full planner's problem. And then what's interesting is to um, take the derivative of this welfare function with respect to G to see a bit all the, all the um, channels through which public spending affects welfare. Uh, so we can take the derivative of welfare With respect to G, and here the goal is to highlight a little bit all the channels through which public spending affects welfare, um, and understand the trade-off, uh, the trade-offs that are faced by our uh, social planner here. Okay, so uh, if we do that, what do we have? So we have derivative of U. So the total derivative, the derivative of the uh, social welfare to, with respect to G is going to be equal to du dg. So that's the partial derivative of U with respect to G. That's the second term plus du dc. Uh, this is a um, partial derivative of the utility with respect to private consumption times, because G shows up in both uh, G um, Public spending shows up directly into the utility plus indirectly through uh, private spending. So DUG is DUG plus DUDC times the derivative of uh, private con private consumption with respect to public consumption. And that's so a one, once you take the derivative of one, that disappears. Then you have a minus DUDG. Then you have a minus v prime of u, so derivative of v with respect to u, times du dg. Then you have a minus 1 that comes from the here. Uh, so here we, here we have um, all of this. And so actually, it's nice and useful to rewrite this derivative. So that's just du dg. Then I'm going to take the minus one out, so I have minus du dc. And then I have a minus du dc times du dg. Well, in fact, that's a you know, total derivative. So if I want to be just a little bit more, let's try to be a little bit more precise here. I mean, in fact, if I want to be, you know, just uh, if I want to even simplify the notation, we can even simplify the notation here and just call it um, u prime of g, u prime of this. That's going to simplify everything. As udc minus dudc times u prime of g. Oops, sorry. Okay, u prime of g times. 1 plus v prime of u. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, all right. So this is uh, this is what we have, and here we can see so all the aspects through which um, we can see all the channels through which uh, public spending operates. Uh, and so let me let me do another thing that will be even nicer. So here du dg. Okay, that's positive. We leave it here. Minus du dc very very good, but this because this is going then we'll have a plus du dc times minus u prime of g here I put the minus because I know that uh, u prime of g tends to be negative so I put this minus here so I have a positive term times one plus v prime of u. Okay, great, and here we see all, all the ways through which. Um, Public spending affects welfare. So you can see du dg. This is a first direct. So this is just a direct effects. This is just saying more public goods. You know, more public goods lead to higher uh, welfare just because uh, just because people value uh, public goods. Here you have minus du dc. So what is this? Well, it's because when I take one extra worker. This is basically the idea that if you take the number of employed workers as fixed, if you move a worker from the private sector to the public sector, then you know when you increase a bit the public sector, you reduce the private sector. So this is just uh, this is just saying that uh, when you have more public workers, if we take the number of workers as given, you have less private workers. And of course, less private workers, this means less welfare because people value also private goods. So this is just uh, the two aspects here. Uh, so this is uh, the crowding out of private workers by public workers. Okay, And then you have an extra term here, which basically says that uh, through this, so this says that uh, more public workers means less unemployment. Now, whether less unemployment is good or bad, you know, it's going to depend on whether the economy is too tight or too uh, slack or too tight. So that's going to be very interesting. Uh, but less unemployment, you know, through this term, it, it may mean more pro production workers, less production workers. So that we'll have to see, but that's going to show through this uh, term. But the idea is that when you change public spending, you change unemployment, and therefore you're going to affect uh, you're going to affect the number of production workers. And you know when you affect, you know, if somehow you manage to increase your, let's say your economy is too slack, you reduce unemployment, that increases the number of production workers. Well, this is going to uh, this is going to lead then directly, you know, if we assign all of these production workers, the private sector is going to lead to uh, is going to lead to more private workers and therefore more welfare. And so all these extra terms that we have here. Um, all these extra terms here, where the number of public workers affects unemployment, and then unemployment will affect the total number of production workers, and that, you know, positively or negatively, this is a stabilization, you know, just to, uh, this is a stabilization aspect of the analysis. Uh, the fact that G affects you, and for instance, in public finance, so this is something that was, uh, so this is something that, uh, Emmanuel Saez and I developed in a 2019 restart paper, um, but this was the stabilization element was is new to our analysis. Um, so in public finance, there has been a lot of work on optimal um, public expenditure, but it was always in a framework in which stabilization was not considered. There was no element that you know there was too much slack or too little slack, or there was no unemployment, too little unemployment, 
too much unemployment. So this stabilization aspect that you could use public spending for stabilization, although it's very common in macro, was never studied in public finance. And in macro, because we never take into account the, um, the value of public goods, you know, public spending were never really studied in a kind of welfare maximization setup, really, um, because public spending is always assumed to be wasteful, um, you know. Um, so public finance looked at public spending as not wasteful, but as something that's valuable and provide public good, but without the stabilization aspect. Micro considered stabilization, but never thinking about the value of public spending. So here we're bringing both things together, uh, where you can see here, Um, so DUDG, DUDC is the value of public good uh, in the utility function. That's really like the, this is really like the, uh, this is like the public econ, this is the public econ side. And this is what basically goes back to um, Sam Wilson 1954. Uh, and then this extra term where you look at the effect of public spending on use at the stabilization aspect. This is both for macro and that's new to our analysis. And we'll try to bring together the public account side and the stabilization side to have an optimal design of stimulus packages. So this is bringing stabilization to the Sam Wilson, uh, to Sam Wilson framework. And we'll see how, we'll see how in a second now that we've understood like the different channels to which public spending affects welfare. 